Good morning, Texas History. Uh, this is your professor, and uh, we're going to have a series of lectures today on the coming of the Texas Revolution, the Texas Revolution, and the successful conclusion of it. But before we get underway, we're going to have a, need to talk to you about some uh, basics uh, and some reminders. Uh, first of all, when you uh, get prepared, if you're going to take the optional exam, it'll be this Thursday, so come with that 882 Scantron brand, 882, or the 886E that you've used throughout the semester, the Scantron brand. Uh, is sufficient. So uh, for those of you who are not going to take the optional, as you know, you do not need to come to class that day. Uh, so uh, I hope you're prepared for that and we'll see you if you are, uh, see if you do take the optional exam. So in addition to that, uh, I, in, when I send out an email with the link to this video, uh, just check to make sure you look at your readings and all that sort of stuff on there. Uh, in addition to that, you'll get the final exam time off to communicate it that way as well. Also, one of the things I'd tell you to do today is, is to go... Uh, this lecture is designed to be fairly exhaustive, uh, but at the same time, it's not going to be as exhaustive as what you might get uh, by me having about two or three class periods. So in that sense, we're a little bit tight on time and don't have the time to go through it all. However, I would encourage you strongly to go on the Handbook of Texas Online, the Handbook of Texas Online. Uh, put together by the Texas State Historical Association, and that that uh, website is a really good source for uh, a lot of Texana history. You might find it interesting. Uh, even after you get done with the class, you have a question about why this happened or that happened. It's good. Uh, but their sources on the Texas Revolution, their writing on the Texas Revolution is really good, and uh, you can learn quite a bit from it. So one of the things I'd suggest you do as you prep for this final exam is that you get ready for the Alamo, you get ready for Go as you get ready for San Jacinto, uh, you start looking for various and sundry individuals in those uh, stories, say like a Jose Urea, whom I've already mentioned in class, San Santana, General Filosola, uh, and then there's quite a few other Texians, and Edward Burleson, T.J. Rusk, and what have you. All those names will be peppered uh, throughout the general entries for the San Jacinto campaign, the Texas Revolution, uh, and, and even specific uh, even specific biographies on those men. Uh, truth be told, what I'd suggest you do is just go on that website and start typing in like the Texas Revolution, and they should bring you up a list and a, a, a menu to choose from. There's a lot of information there. It's a good reading and good suggest, a good place to kind of uh, augment what I say in this lecture today. So I can't emphasize enough the Texas Handbook of Texas Online to you in preparation for your final exam next week. So all right, so here we go. And by the way, always, if you have any questions, email me, and I will be glad to get back to you on uh, the subject. So, uh, anyways, long story short here is is that we need to take care of some Texas history and uh, get ourselves basically ready for the final exam. Actually, give me one second. I forgot to do something uh, as uh, I'm sitting here playing with a computer and got to get everything just right. Nope, that's not it. Cancel. Love technology. There we go. Do not disturb. That's me. Okay, so, all right, now we're ready to begin. When we last met, uh, Sam Houston was uh, kind of in the throes of drunkenness. He was in the throes of dissipation. And uh, quite honestly, I think about where y'all left off as a class was basically at uh, Sam Houston and his girl, his uh, first wife, Eliza, Eliza Allen. And uh, Houston, whatever the exact reason was, returns his wife to her father and it explodes the political situation in Tennessee. This all takes place in 1829, early 1830, and Houston is absolutely being scoriated by the press there in Nashville. And so in the span of effectively one month, maybe two months, maybe three months, but in effectively the span of half a year, Sam Houston goes from being an heir apparent to Andrew Jackson, a golden boy with a golden face and a golden grin, the man who will be the next, uh, certainly be governor if he wants it for another term because Jackson favors him, and potentially even president of the United States in 1832 running for that office. The problem is Houston now is uh, being absolutely pummeled for what he does. The Allen faction is going to mercilessly attack him. 
And so Houston responds uh, with a bit of regret, with a whole lot of self-pity. Uh, he kind of he kind of loses his bearings. And so what Houston does is he resigns the governorship of Tennessee and goes to live with the Cherokee once again. And so in a sense for Sam Houston, the man, Houston's uh, refuge is the Cherokee Nation. And so Houston moves back to the Cherokee Nation. When he first lived with them as a child, as a teenager, uh, they gave him the nickname the Raven and they were in Tennessee. But by this point in time, the Cherokees of East Tennessee had moved all the way uh, to the Oklahoma Territory, well, to us Oklahomans, to them the Indian Territory, uh, just west of Fort Smith, Arkansas. And there the Cherokee live. The chief is still, is still John Jolly, a.k.a. Ulatika. And uh, there Houston is headed toward them. But before Houston gets there, Houston proceeds to crawl into the bottom of a bottle. Uh, if uh, you talk about alcoholism and the the effects upon a man and his career uh, by today's standards, if Sam Houston was living today and he did the same things today that he did back in the 1820s or 30s, he'd be nowhere close to being governor of any state ever again, let alone anybody talking about him seriously being president. And they did talk about him seriously being president again in the 1850s. It just said realistically he had no chance. But uh, Houston is going to crawl into the bottom of a bottle, and he is going to drink a massive amount. And uh, to give you an example of how much he drank and how legendary his uh, dissipation was, uh, one time, uh, this is actually after he makes it to the Cherokee Territory, he establishes uh, his uh, wigwam he called Neosha, which was also kind of a trading post. And uh, Houston, while he was going into the Cherokee Nation, was pulled over by a U.S. Marshal that was patrolling the area. Now, some of you may be thinking, in 1820 or 1830 America, how on earth can anybody get pulled over because they didn't have cars? Well, Houston was dragging a wagon. He was pulling a wagon. He was uh, driving a wagon that was full of barrels of hard liquor. Uh, cold drinks, as my grandmother used to say. And so uh, when we talk about the uh, cold uh, drinks at hand, we're talking about brandy and cognac and whiskey and vodka and all sorts of fun stuff. A lot of it, gallons of it, in fact. I mean, we're not talking five-gallon buckets here. We're talking barrels of whiskey, barrels of cognac, and so forth. And when Houston got stopped by this U.S. Marshal, the Marshal asked uh, Houston and said, uh, Sir, uh, don't you understand, do you not know that the Cherokee cannot handle fire water? They cannot handle uh, alcohol and, by treaty with the U.S. government, are not permitted to have alcohol on their reservation. It cannot be transported in. And Houston said effectively, my name is Sam Houston, and uh, this is not for the Cherokee, but for me. It's personal consumption. Personal consumption. And the marshal thought a moment, evidently, and said, you know, you do have a reputation of being a heavy drinker. And so, yes, uh, go right ahead, sir. I understand how this could be personal consumption. Uh, what ended up happening to it? Uh, was it sold? Probably a little bit. But if I know Sam Houston, that man could not drink one drink when he could drink 52. Uh, he's one. He's an alcoholic. There's just no two ways about it. Sam Houston is an alcoholic. Classically in the sense that uh, he drank uh, all the time. Classically in the sense that he could not just drink one, but he needed ten. Uh, those sorts of things, and it's going to cost him. It cost him the governorship in a sense. It cost him respect amongst the uh, community, uh, meaning the Anglo-white community of Washington, D.C., and it almost cost him the, uh, uh, the friendship of Andrew Jackson. But it doesn't. It ultimately uh, is going to be Houston's, uh, his, uh, his, the worm in his apple, the bane of his existence, that being alcohol. But eventually, actually, when it comes to Sam Houston and alcohol, it is worth noting that Houston is going to ditch the alcohol, and Houston will go sober later on in life, especially after he meets his last wife, his third wife, a woman named Margaret Lee. And she kind of puts him on the straight and narrow. Uh, I think she she worked on him, begged him, cajoled him. I mean, any sort of word uh, you know that a wife can do to a husband, uh, I think Margaret did it to him. She was a staunch Baptist, and she was a thoroughgoing Baptist, and she was bluntly put, uh, regardless of what you think of drinking or not drinking, uh, she was what Sam Houston needed to have because he was going to die probably of cirrhosis of the liver somewhere around 52. Uh, but Margaret came in, and she sobered him up. And... Uh, 
he got him religion, he got straightened up, and he was a productive member of the U.S. Senate and the governorship of te Texas late in his career. So that's all after that sobering up is all after the Texas Revolution, and even after while he's president of the Republic of Texas, because he was prone to getting drunk while he was president of the Republic of Texas, too. But on that trip back here in 1830-31, on that trip westward out to the, ten to the Cherokee Nation, Houston is going to uh, take, he runs out of money, he drinks it all, and in order to raise money to buy more alcohol, he proceeds to tell dirty jokes and stories. That's the way he raised money. Another such instance, he got drunk one night, and well, he got drunk most nights, as I've already said, but he got drunk one night particularly so. He and three other, or excuse me, two other men, they proceeded to go out and uh, build up a bonfire. And only, as you, some of you know, only drunks would do this sort of thing. Some of you have seen friends who have done stupid stuff, but drunks do the dangest things. Well, anyways, Houston is going to, uh, and his buddies are going to stand around a bonfire, light it on fire, and then decide, well, what are we going to do? How do we celebrate this? Houston evidently suggested, because he was a fan of the classics, a fan of Greek mythology, he suggested, why don't we uh, start uh, making sacrifices to the Greek god Bacchus, uh, the god of revelry and dissipation and, and what have you. And so Houston and his uh, companions start ripping off parts of their clothing and every time they throw a piece of clothing onto the fire in the honor of Bacchus they take a drink before it's all said and done all three men are buck naked passed out and drunk as a skunk around this uh, this bonfire it's not one of Houston's better moments in his life but it is one of his moments in his life uh, last but not least is to kind of give you an idea how deep into the bottle he went and how sudsy and how weepy some of his letters of this era would be, because they are pretty sudsy and often very weepy. And if you've if you've ever been around a drunk or an alcoholic, uh, or somebody who just simply mean is drunk, not so much the alcoholic when I said drunk earlier, but now here I mean tr a drunk on the one hand, an alcoholic on the other. Some people react uh, to the alcohol very depressed. And they get kind of, you know, regretful and all that sort of stuff. And when you read Jack, read Houston's letter to President Jackson, actually his letter is plural, you get that melancholy. And the Cherokee kind of got tired of it. Houston would help them, but at other times they thought Houston was just hurting them. They changed his name, or at least some people quit calling him the Raven. Now they started calling Sam Houston the Big Drunk because of his excessiveness. But in about 1832, Sam Houston starts to crawl out of the bottle. He, he was in it for two, three years in the aftermath of his family, his, his wife's uh, departure. And by the way, uh, that was something kind of like Theodore Roosevelt. You never talk to Theodore Roosevelt about, about his uh, first wife, Alice. That was kind of a forbidden subject. With uh, Sam Houston, you did not talk to him about that first marriage. Evidently, only a few people did. No, he never killed anybody, over to my knowledge. never threatened to kill anybody, over to my knowledge. But it was a polite thing to do, is to not ask him, well, tell us about your first wife, Sam. Uh, but I think Branch Archer in the early days may have gotten the story, and so you get these variations of what happened, and some are talked about it. But by 1832, Sam Houston is going to uh, kind of wake up, and he is appointed, uh, kind of, Jackson kind of gives him something to do, gives him a little job, because frankly, Houston needed the money, and to keep him from just completely dying out in the Cherokee Territory. He, Houston, becomes a Cherokee agent, and so Houston from uh, time to time will have to travel uh, to, uh, he'll ha Houston will have to travel to Washington City, or Washington, D.C., as it's now called, and there, when he's, he's there, he sometimes meets with the president, and even in this broken down state, Houston still has entree with his old general, and uh, uh, Jackson, maybe warily, but he will certainly open the door to Houston and let him in and visit. <clears throat> It was while Houston was in town that Jackson, whom, as I've said before to you, was a very polarizing figure, Houston, like his mentor in Texas, was polarizing as well. Jackson is going to be the head of what today we call the Democratic Party. If your family or you vote Democratic, Andrew Jackson is in your political legacy, is in your political uh, uh, heritage. And uh, frankly, so is, in a sense, Thomas Jefferson and, and that business. But the Democratic Party is, one of the, is really, in a sense, one of the first political parties in the history of the United States, and Jackson heads it. 
The opposite thing, though, is, is there's not always in the United States, it seems like, especially the way the system is written out in the Constitution, you're going to have two parties. Uh, not three or ten like other European nations or other nations have, but uh, about two parties is what we got, bigger parties. And so with, the, uh, with Jackson being the head of the Democratic Party, there's another political faction out there called the Whigs, W-H-I-G. The Whig political party is the opposite uh, of Jackson. The head of the Whig political party would be, say, Henry Clay. Another Whig per politician would be John Quincy Adams. And there's a dozen others who are out there. William Henry Harrison is another one as well. So there are plenty of Whig politicians in the 1820s and 30s, many of whom snipe at uh, the president. And it's not unlike today, where the Republicans will snipe at Obama. Whenever there's another Republican president, there will be Democrats sniping at the Republicans. So it's, it is what it is. I, I don't get too worked up about people sniping at the president. That's part of the deal with being in politics. And so uh, with Houston being in town, there were people who took advantage of Houston's dissipation, Houston's uh, fall from grace out of the governorship of Tennessee. Houston was a, kind of still radioactive in polite society. And a Whig politician worth his salt would say, you know what, this is an opportunity to attack Jackson. And so uh, Houston is going to be uh, the lightning rod to Jackson. Uh, and the congressman is a fellow out of Ohio named Stanberry, William Stanberry. Stanberry is a Whig uh, politician, and he, Stanberry, accuses Houston, amongst other things, of pilfering money, stealing from the Cherokee, and on and on from there. Long story short is, is that Houston, who was in town because of uh, he was meeting with the Interior Department, that wasn't existence then, but he was meeting, meeting with the Indian Bureau and, the, and Jackson, and he was doing business. Houston challenges Stanberry to a duel. Stanberry said, this is not the way we do things today. Dueling is out of favor. Dueling is passe. You can take your duel and go suck a lemon on it. So the long story short was that Stanberry basically blew off Houston's challenge to a duel. And as luck would have it one evening, as Houston and Stanberry were uh, in Washington, D.C., their paths crossed. And uh, Houston said, I, I challenge you a duel and you wouldn't give me satisfaction. Now I'm going to take satisfaction now. And so H Houston... Uh, takes a walking stick, you remember that hamburger leg that he's got, he takes his walking stick and proceeds to beat Stanberry with it. Not unlike a later uh, situation in the Senate in the 1850s with a guy named Preston Brooks and Charles Sumner. At least the beating part is similar. So Houston is just whooping, and giving a good old-fashioned whooping to Stanberry. Stanberry pulls out a pistol and pulls the trigger, snap, misfire, and all it does is enrage Houston all the more, and Houston breaks his hickory stick over top of Stanberry's head and just beats him half to death. But more particularly, the witnesses said this. It said that old Stanberry got a kick, as a uh, witness put it one time. He said uh, Stanberry got kicked in other regions. <laughs> so Stanberry got kicked. Uh, in the family jewels, so to speak, and uh, so it is a, I mean, it is absolutely a massive situation. It is a mess there in in uh, Washington, D.C., and so Houston's in the middle of it. Of course, it sucks Jackson in, and everybody's all a Twitter about it. So anyways, uh, in that situation, it's just simple assault, basically. That's a low-grade felony, but it's simple assault. I say simple assault to us today, having that stick would have been uh, aggravated, but back then it probably wouldn't have been. Long story short was is that, yeah, it could have uh, Stanberry initially just filed charges, of course he could. But why file regular charges when you can make some political hay out of this? So Stanberry promptly, so Stanberry promptly files charges with the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives under the Constitution has a right to... Uh, uh, to try members and former members and has prerogatives and that sort of thing. And on top of that, a congressman sh cannot be molested, or uh, that's not molestation, but not be attacked or whatever while it's in session. Generally speaking, you can't be attacked. So Stanberry is going to make this into political theater. We're going to try Houston before the House of Representatives. And so uh, Stanberry calls Houston in. It is 
full gala stuff. I mean, absolutely everybody who's anybody is there and ready to hear yeah, Houston's defense about uh, Houston's defense and what goes on in Houston. How, why did you do this and all that sort of business. And so Houston gets up and gives approximately an eight-hour speech. Now, maybe it's a little longer than it, maybe nine or ten hours, but it was a long speech. And if you think sitting in front of me and this camera is bad enough, or you think sitting in front of me in a classroom is bad enough, you can only imagine. But actually, the difference is, is that Sam Houston's a far better speaker than I'll ever be. Sam Houston has a gift at speaking. That's one of the great things people always remarked about him. That man knew how to speak, whether it's short term, long term, whatever. And it was a it was really a production and he did it all himself on the morning of his great defense of his uh, actions against congressman stanberry houston got even drunker than normal i say the morning of it was really the night before he got drunk as a skunk i mean absolutely for houston he was blitzed as he might have said it once uh, drunk back sober round midnight he goes uh, and make, put, sends in the word. He's at a hotel getting cleaned up. He's getting good clothing. Jackson gave him some money to get, get out of the Cherokee garb and into uh, uh, you know Anglo attire for the time period. And this about midnight, uh, this, uh, he, he, Houston, called for this barber to come uh, clean him up and shave him and get his whiskers and all that. And so as Houston was sitting there, he said, I'm working on a speech. I'm going to do this. And Houston uh, said, he pulled open the desk drawer. You can't see my arm. He pulled open his desk drawer. He said, you see that pouch of money? You see that pistol right there? If I, when you come back at 7 a.m. to give me my shave and give me my haircut, if I'm passed out at 7 a.m. and I'm not responsive, just open that drawer, take the money and shoot me in the head and it'll all be okay. Well, obviously, Houston didn't get shot in the head. It was all drama for Houston in that sense. And he gets up and he goes and he gives a speech. He talks about the Cherokee Nation and how they were mistreated by the U.S. government. He talks about uh, antiquity. He talks about the, He talks about everything under the sun, the Constitution. He's lecturing on this, that, and the other. It's the proverbial idea that if the law, it, say, as a lawyer, and Houston was a lawyer, amongst other things, he, you know, the basic idea is this. If the facts are against you, are, is you're as a defense attorney. If the facts are against you, argue the law. If the law is against you, argue the facts. And if the law and the facts are against you, pound on the table and make a bunch of shows. And so Houston is doing exactly that. He goes on for eight or nine hours. It is a long speech. And he doesn't really sit down and st stop. He doesn't, you know, doesn't reach down and uh, go to the bathroom or anything. Evidently, he drank just a little bit to keep his throat dry. But at the right time, uh, he, he brought the house down. The galleries were full. The women were weeping. Roses were thrown down from the gallery. It was absolutely pandemonium when Houston uh, gave that speech. And he even got the congressman to crying, too. One of the men in the uh, audience was a fellow named Junius Booth. Junius Booth, uh, you may know him uh, for his uh, son. His son is uh, John Wilkes Booth of Lincoln assassinations fame. But Junius Booth, who was a well-known actor in his own right, said that Houston, with just a week's preparation, could have played one of the uh, played uh, Henry in Shakespearean plays. Just with a week's preparation, he was that good at it. And Will Booth was just absolutely moved. By the way, Houston's personal attorney for this whole thing was Francis Scott Key. And, of course, you know Francis Scott Key from the Star Spangled Banner. But Houston, ultimately, this is all for naught. The uh, the House of Representatives, though may have been they may have been weeping, politics was greater than emotion, and the House of Representatives, if I recall correctly, was was led by the Whigs at that time, or certainly a large minority party, <coughs> and the. Uh, and the House of Representatives will reprimand Houston as, and give him the reprimand in the floor in the well of the House. And he got it. And then Stanberry, not satisfied with that, then goes through the legal process. And Houston is going to be charged and uh, convicted of assault. And he is fined $500. Houston does not go to jail. But it's all news. It's all news. And it brings Sam Houston's name to the forefront once again. Houston himself said later, he said, if they had just taken me for justice of the peace and fined me $15 for this, I would have been out and done. 
but they made a big deal about it and they brought my name back. They set me up. And so, in a sense, his resurrection as a politician was given by William Stanbury. Well, by 1832, now 33, Houston is now going to start proceeding to Texas. And while he's in Texas, he's going to start looking at boundaries between the United States and Tech Mexico and the boundaries of the Cherokee and that sort of thing. That's his official cover, as the CIA might call it today. But reality seems to be that President Jackson and Sam Houston had kind of an understanding that uh, if Houston could do a little more, he could do a little more. Officially, Andrew Jackson, as President of the United States, could say nothing officially about what Houston was up to other than this is a boundary commission. This guy's looking and checking on the Cherokee. He's checking on this for me. But uh, in no way does Houston have any uh, action, you know, right to action uh, about breaking Mexico and uh, breaking Mexico up and bringing Texas to the United States. Uh, Jackson had for some time, like Adams before him, tried to... Uh, Houston, or excuse me, the Jackson administration had tried to break Texas away by buying Texas from Mexico, and the Mexicans, as we talked about in class, were not interested in selling. So those are some basic uh, uh, aspects there. So Houston's now in Texas in the 1830s, the early early 1830s. So you've got prominent men, Travis, who's now a, a hero. He's a lightning bolt. Now the thing about Travis, always remember, is is that in the in the coming of the Texas Revolution, he is a part, Travis is what is part of what's called the War Party. Bowie, who is a braggart, uh, and as I may have said in class, I don't know if I said it like this, uh, the, the Mexicans, probably this is Castilian, because I always ask students who speak Spanish and they don't know the word, uh, but the uh, word is fanfaron, the fanfaron Santiago, and, and translates out, evidently, that braggart James. Bowie is charismatic and mercurial in a sense. He draws people to himself, but he's always kind of that sl uh, shady, slick aspect to him. And then, of course, last but not least is uh, Houston. Now, he's in Texas. He takes the oath of uh, allegiance to Mexico. He starts to set himself up in Texas, maybe a little land speculation as well, and Houston is going to settle in Nacogdoches. So now you have three major names in Texas, not to mention Burleson, not to mention half a dozen other people, that sort of stuff as well. But uh, here we are. Now we're ready to really get underway. In the aftermath of the disturbances at Anahuac and, frankly, at Velasco and at Nacogdoches, I would invite you, when you get to doing your legwork for this final exam, take a look at that stuff about the disturbances on the Handbook of Texas Online. The last thing, uh, the next thing is, is that uh, in the aftermath of those disturbances, here's another one of those, those cultural clashes and it's also a political clash, too, between the state of Coahuila e Texas, or in a sense, the state of Texas now, and the clash between the Mexican government. You So in a sense, you have the two major reasons of the Texas Revolution, politics of Mexico, which is a mess, and then the second one is the cultural clash between the Anglos and the, and the Hispanics, is this. In the aftermath of the Texas Revolution, the disturbances at Anahuac in 1832, now in, uh, there's going to be what are called conventions. In the American, which really should say English, which also can say Anglo uh, tradition, in the old English common law, in the old Scottish practice, all from the mother country from that perspective, having a people's convention, say, uh, even impromptu, not called by anybody, is absolutely fundamentally legal. It's kind of like saying, can we form a militia on our own? Well, yes, and especially in the antique days, the days we're talking, uh, militias were absolutely fundamentally okay uh, in the American slash English traditions. I mean, I say absolutely fundamentally. There may be a few tweaks here or there, but it's basically okay. For a convention of the people, a peaceful convention to petition the government to uh, raise their concerns and then send petitions and uh, manifestos and stuff, as long as it's peaceable, and even that's a little bit of a fungible word, peaceable is, the fact of the matter is, is that we, that, uh, the Anglos understood they have a fundamental God-given, it's not man-given, but God-given right to assemble and to uh, complain about the government if they want to. Not unlike, say, groups today who may complain about the government spending too much money or not enough money or what do they do in Baltimore or not, what have you. So you get together and you do that. 
So when you talk about the these uh, things, there's going to be two conventions, one in 1832, the other in 1833. For And the conventions, one's at San Felipe, and the other one is in, uh, I believe it was San Felipe as well. You might check. They may have been at, uh, I believe it was San Felipe, the second one. But either way, these conventions, as far as the Anglos are concerned, are com completely legitimate. Now, however, of course, but the Hispanics, the the Tejanos, which are Hispanic Texians, and the Mexicans in general, the Mexican Hispanic tradition, which comes from Spain, of course, a spontaneous convention, a convention emanating out of the people, is absolutely fundamentally uh, it, it doesn't work. It's, it's absolutely wrong. It is uh, illegal, if not outright dangerous and seditious. So when the convention of 1832 met in San Felipe in the afterwash of the Anahuac disturbances and all the others, the other two disturbances that go along with it, uh, <clears throat> this is pretty much almost exclusively an Anglo convention. There are very few, I believe there may have been one or two, but there were basically no Tejanos in the crowd and it was all made up of Anglos. Now the the request from the convention was not that bad. It was, at least by our standards, exemption from customs, which had been the case, control of customs officials, perhaps repeal of the anti-immigration law. I mean, that's the law of April 6, 1830. <clears throat> land title reform to make it easier. Public land for public schools, militia, and Texas statehood. And you can read up on those things in that Texas handbook online uh, in the process. But uh, and I really would su uh, suggest you get the major points out of it. But the fact of the matter is is that uh, this is not okay. So the first convention breaks up, and Stephen Austin is going to be the chair of the first convention. By the way, Stephen Austin was not particularly fond of these conventions because he was trying to hold Texas together. And Stephen Austin is is wanting, I guess, in a sense, Mexican, excuse me, Texas statehood within Mexico. That's an important qualification. Texas statehood within Mexico, but he, Austin, also knows the ticklish nature of the politics in Mexico, particularly when it comes to what the Anglos do and what the Mexicans do, and it, or the Hispanics do. There, there's some issues there. Um, most of the, by the way, to make clear about this, most of the politics, uh, Mexican politics at these conventions, these are Yorkinos. These are old Yorkinos who are disgruntled with the rise of the centralist faction, the rise of Bustamante and his boys down in Mexico City. So there's there's a lot of moving parts. And Austin, by his association with this, is trying to moderate. For most of his time in Texas, Austin is, is really a moderate force or a moderating force in Texas politics. When there are hotheads like a Travis or a Fannin or a Bowie or somebody else who is really pushing the envelope saying, we need to do X, Y, and Z, we need to get into it, and some who are even early on calling for independence, it's Austin who is the conciliatory type. He's Austin who's throwing cold water on it. And frankly, Austin is in a sense the spokesman of what the old 300 factions, some of the earliest settlers who have the most to lose if Mexico gets disgruntled with Texas and rips apart all of those uh, land titles, all of those uh, deeds, and all of those uh, commitments Mexico said, and said, you Anglos are nothing but trouble, get out. And so these... Uh, these old 300 and old line settlers and other colonies, they're much more peaceable and much more conciliatory than the hotheads and the Johnny-come-latelys who show up in Texas. So in, in effect, in Texas, as you go from 1833 forward, you're going to have two factions in Texas. The war faction on the one hand, which is going to be the clenched fist, in the sense that Travis uh, really belongs to this. And in a sense, Bowie does too. He becomes more uh, a, a part of it. Fannin, who is later a fame at Goliath, is a part as well. And then you have the Austins and the Grosses, and uh, Gross is kind of a mixed bag, but you'll have these others. The Many of the Tejanos would be the more conciliatory faction because if you really get after it and you start poking the tiger, the tiger might eat you. Or to say it a little differently, either when you talk about revolution, either you kill the king or the king kills you. It's just a maxim in life that uh, when you start talking revolution or talking about breaking away, that is potentially some real nasty things. And that, that's a nasty genie that comes out of the bottle, too. So truth be told, when you, when you discuss uh, Texas uh, history, 
uh, I think it's fair to remember, and I'd write it down about like this, is, is that as late as 1835, and in 1835, especially the latter half of 1835, you really have uh, shooting going on. You have the war breaking out everywhere. And as late as late 1835, there are men, honest men, sincere men, uh, long-term Texans as late as late 1835 or even early 1836, who were saying, we must be conciliatory and me we must try to stay within Mexico independence and uh, independence from Mexico was not immediately something people just sought out now some saw it early on and chased after it and got what they wished eventually you know how the history works out but not everybody will go that route not everybody's a radical it's it's, it's important the analogous thing is is that in them saying the American Revolution uh, the old statement is thirds uh, for, for independence, third was for to stay loyal to Britain, a third didn't give a dang. That's not exactly true in Texas, but the point is is that not everybody just wakes up and says, oh yeah, independence is the, great, the, the best way. That's not the way it works, because you have a lot to lose if this fails. And it takes a while, but eventually they do come around. But it's not until 1836, really, that the majority of at least Anglo Texians and many and a good number of Tejano Texians are going to sign up for independence from Mexico, not just independence from Coahuila, but Texas stays in Mexico. So those are all factions and, and activities working in the background and so on. After these two conventions meet, one in 32, now the second one in 33, the second convention, the uh, convention of 1833, is going to send a resolution, a series of resolutions down to Mexico City, and they pick three men to go. Uh, Erasmo Seguin was one. Uh, Dr. Uh, I think it was, it wasn't Asheville Smith, it was, let me give me a second to look at my notes here. Uh, D Dr. James Miller and Stephen Austin were going to send these, uh, to take this resolution down to the government in Mexico City and basically give all the, uh, uh, give the Mexican government to let them know what Texas and the Texians were thinking. Well, in 1833, now 34, the problem is, is that you're going to have an outbreak of a massive cholera epidemic. And the cholera epidemic of 1833 is horrific. It is going to kill people left and right, up and down, all over the place. In fact, it kills Bowie's family, uh, meaning his in-laws. And so, in a sense, Bowie's going to be shorn of his wife, he's going to be shorn of his political protection, and in a sense, kind of perhaps that radicalizes him and can make him even more of a, of a charismatic figure in the coming of the Texas Revolution. And Austin almost caught, well, he evidently caught a little bit of cholera while he was in Mexico City. And while, we're done, while Austin's in Mexico City, uh, he's by himself. Erasmo Seguin was not at the convention of 1833. They dumped this resolution on his lap and they said, you need to go carry the water. And Seguin said, I've got business to attend to. Well, what do you need to do? I need to rearrange my sock drawer. And no, he, he uh, uh, Seguin did not say, I need to rearrange my sock drawer. But the point was, is, is that Austin, Austin uh, when he met with Seguin to hand him the resolution, Seguin handed it right back to him and said, I've got other things to do. This is not one of the things I'm going to touch. Dr. Miller, he is treating the sick of the cholera epidemic, so it's Austin alone, and he goes down to Mexico City in 1833, early 1834, and it was Mil and it's Austin who's going to meet with, uh, well, the Mexican government under, well, first Santana, and also the Mexican government under uh, uh, Gomez uh, Farias, Gomez Farias, and that's a sp ideally that is a a friendly government to the idea of Texas independence from Coahuila. And I said that's pre precisely for a reason. Because one of the things that burned the Texians in 33 and 34 is, is that the Texians really want independence from Coahuila as a state. Texas needs its own statehood. Texas needs to be a state in Mexico. And the fact was is that Coahuila was always the big brother in reality and in politics, Texas only would have two or three representatives in the state legislature of Coahuila, Texas, and Coahuila would have the rest. 
it was really an inequ inequitable situation and it rankled a lot of Texians. And there's also land speculation involved in all this. It's a whole lot of stuff. In fact, the capital of Coahuila, e, Texas is going to move from Saltillo uh, and up to Monclova uh, at this time period. It is really turbulent. And in Austin, he is down in Mexico City. And you remember when we were looking at uh, Wikipedia where it's the back and forth between Santana and Gomez Farias? Kind of like a ping pong ball going across the net on the table. What I guess I'm trying to say for, to you is this. Is, is that Austin's down there. He's negotiating. It is a completely turbulent situation. And Austin is going to become frustrated with the Mexican government. His, his Austin's meetings with Gomez Farias evidently go poorly. Farias is kind of a true believer. And he, but he's also a Mexican, and he's a very proud Mexican. And evidently, Austin kind of rubbed Farias the wrong way. And there were several times, uh, evidently, Farias got just irate with Austin. Austin tried to play it out as I did okay, but the other men in the room said Austin just got bamboozled and, and taken to the woodshed by president or acting president Farias. Uh, Santana was supposed to be a friend to Texas, but Santana was Santana. He was for himself, nobody else. Uh, but it's a mess down there. But what gets Austin into the biggest trouble is this. Austin is going to write a weepy letter. And if you ever get to reading the history of Texas, and especially Austin's history, one of the things you'll find is he has a bad habit. I say it's a habit. It's just a he has to vent. He has no wife. He has no brother Brown Austin's been dead for some time. I didn't really mention it in class, but Brown Austin died in, I believe it was a yellow fever outbreak in New Orleans in the 18, late 20s, early 30s. So Austin has to vent, and sometimes he vents to the wrong people. He writes a letter uh, to the Ayunta Miento Council in Bejar that basically uh, talks about independence a little bit and a hint here and a hint there. We might need to take things into our own hands. It was not quite out and out subversive, but it, boy, it was right on the line. And the Ayunta Mayento was never, uh, Behar was never exactly excited about all these conventions and councils and so forth. And so they forwarded it back down to Mexico City. Austin, who had concluded business in Mexico City, was actually riding northward, headed up to uh, San Antonio to Behar. He, get, he, Austin, got arrested. I believe it was in Saltillo. Uh, then he's going to be sent back to Mexico City. He's going to spend the next basically year and a half in jail. Austin is going to be in jail either in a dank inquisition prison, which is a good way to get yourself killed from either pneumonia or some other sort of disease. Uh, but uh, the second thing is Austin, if he wasn't in the, that jail, at, which at first he was, he was also under house arrest. The problem Austin has is that his health is not great. He, is, he has worn himself out over the issue of Texas and all of Texas. And being in that jail never helps him. His health is broken, frankly, in Mexico City, and he's not long for this world. Stephen Austin is going to die uh, by the end of 1836, but he was a busted man physically because of his time in Mexican jails. To be clear about this, he's not abused, he's not whipped or beaten, and evidently the food, his treatment was fairly decent. Uh, but Austin was a political prisoner, and uh, he brought some of it on himself. But that's the nature of that system, that's the nature of that beast down there. It is turbulent, crazy, and uh, it's just all over the place, messy. So Austin's in jail, and while he's in jail, many in Texas, is, and for all, for that matter, all of the Gulf Coast is dealing with the cholera outbreak. The Mexican Congress fled for the hills. Uh, in VIPs, meaning like presidents and governor, not presidents, but governors of states, die from cholera. Uh, so Texas and the Texas Revolution is probably shunted off a year because people are trying just to live. But by 1835, the complaints and the worries and all that sort of stuff is coming to a head. The Mexican political situation is becoming more unstable. And this is, remember, when I talked about how Farias and Santana go back and forth. This is the time when Santana says to those priests, those um, Criolos, those army officers who would have Santana be the man, the, the man, uh, the dictator, if you like, uh, the fact of the matter, this is the time when that occurs. This is when Santana says, if you want me to be the, the stabilizing force in Mexico, you've got to give me the power. And Santana got it. 
And it is in this time period in 35, late 34, early 35, that Santana moves on the states. Santana and the government are going to lay low the states. In fact, Santana basically sets aside, pushes aside, declares uh, um, irrelevant in effect uh, the Constitution of 1824. It would be like a president saying the Constitution of the United States is no longer in effect. I'm the Constitution around here right now. And in effect, that's what he, uh, Santana does. Not every state was gung-ho for this. Some states said, thank you, we're glad to be given up our power. Please make us an administrative state. Please appoint governors and leaders over top of us. There were other states that said, no, 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 that's not the way we did. We swore allegiance to the Constitution 1824. We swore allegiance to the Mexican Federal Republic. We did not swear allegiance to a dictator or any leader like that. One of those states, aside from Texas, of course, is Zacatecas. Zacatecas. And the Zacatecas the legislature and the Zacatecas militia are going to uh, try to stand up to Santana and his army. And in fact, actually, the Zacatecas militia, Zacatecas is a wealthy state, has plenty of money to provide good guns and good butter to their uh, people, to their men. And Zacatecas uh, is going to attempt to resist. But unfortunately, this is the really the shortcoming for militias. Militias are oftentimes mythologized in American history and even in Mexican history too about how the, the farmer takes up his guns and he runs into the field and fights and he goes back. And in a sense, that's often true. That has been true. But militias are oftentimes unwieldy, uh, undisciplined, prone to fleeing at the most inopportune times. Uh, their, I, I think their, rep their re reputation is not justly earned. The Zacatecas militia was well equipped, but poorly trained. Santana's army was yeah, okay, tra trained okay, uh, probably even maybe better trained. Uh, their equipment was certainly inferior. They had decent muskets, but again, to that gunpowder issue. But sometimes it's not the uh, gunpowder that matters so much. It's not the weaponry that matters so much, though sometimes it certainly does matter. If you've got a flintlock musket versus a machine gun, yeah, it's going to make a difference. But Napoleon, the great general of France and the great conqueror of Europe in the early 19th century, made it like, said it like this. He said, the moral is the physical as three is to one. Santana's men were better trained, better equipped, and had a higher moral morale, I would argue, than the Zacatecas militia. And the Zacatecas militia will be routed. Then Santana, which is common in the Hispanic tradition and, frankly, other cultures as well, Santana turns loose his troops on the city of Zacatecas, which is kind of like saying, uh, let's say, Oklahoma City is uh, the capital of Oklahoma sort of thing. The city of Zacatecas, and they are going to rape, plunder, and pillage that town as punishment for what happens to those who cross Santana. About the same time all the Zacatecas material is going on in 1835, word gets into Texas, and there had been some agitation in Texas by the war party, uh, Tra Travis and Bowie and those sorts, that, um, that well, there it's now indication that there's a reckoning coming for Texas, too. That the old Federalists are about to be crushed, and Zacatecas, which was far more powerful and far more stronger than Texas is in the same time period, Texas is going to get come up and next, and that Santana is going to come and personally visit. When Stephen F. Austin was released from prison in 1835, he comes back to Texas, and when Austin comes back to Texas, he throws his moral authority, his moral weight behind the war party. He, Stephen Austin, no longer Esteban in his letters, but now Stephen Austin, once again, has come to the conclusion that Mexico cannot be governed. Mexico is ungovernable. Mexico is not the, does not need to handle Texas. So Austin is actually one of the major forces after his incarceration in the uh, movement of Texas away from conciliation to outright rebellion and independence. And also what helps uh, tamp down and end the, the, uh, the peace party, as it was sometimes called, the conciliatory faction in Texas politics in, the 18, in 1835, is the dramatic opening of letters. 
William Barrett Travis, I, I'm skipping over the details of it, but Travis had been agitating even after Anahuac. He doesn't completely go away. There are times he overplays his hand as only a young man could. There's times he seems like he's on the right and whatever. And there are people who in 1834-35 think Travis is a hothead who probably needs to be brought down to size. But Bowie... James Bowie intercept, uh, intercepts a letter for, uh, from a courier. In fact, Bowie was in Nacogdoches one day. Uh, this is in 1835. And Bowie was talking to an old Mexican courier that he knew. And this courier said, man, that was the biggest uh, diplomatic pouch that I've ever carried. It was full of something. Normally, it's got like two letters in it. This was full of letters. And so Bowie, on intuition, Bowie on a hunch, Bowie just maybe having good common sense, Bowie says, to one of his friends, ride down that courier, ride down the next man in the courier's leg, because the courier was sending all those letters, those diplomatic letters to uh, San Augustine, later to the Red River in Louisiana, down to the consulate, the Mexican consulate in New Orleans, and we find out what's going on. So they got that pouch. They ran the guy down. They got the pouch. Bowie in the calls a town meeting impromptu, as only Bowie could, in the middle of Nacogdoches. And all uh, the people who are around, they gathered around him. He takes out the pouch in a dramatic fashion. And all this, by the way, is completely illegal. You want to get in trouble with the government faster than anything, go find a courier pouch and open it when you don't have authority to do so. It's true for the U.S. government. It's true for every government in memorial time. You have to have authority to go into those pouches. Anyways, so Bowie had no authority, but in dramatic fashion, he opens the pouch and he opens some of the letters. And the, one of the letters he opens says, When... Santana comes to Texas with his army. There, I want you to issue an arrest order for William Barrett Travis and a handful of other men. But Travis, arrest William Barrett Travis. Santana is coming to Texas with an army. Oh my gosh, what is going on? And that sobered a lot of Texians up. Sobered a lot of Tejanos up too. And it's now time to no longer sit the fence. Sometimes you can sit the fence and just hope for the best and get with the winner. But other times you can't do that. And you have to choose. And so for the Texians, they had to choose. And so many Anglo-Texians, in fact, pretty much all the Anglo-Texians by the end of 35, especially those uh, who had stuff to lose, especially with the idea that uh, people are being arrested, and you know as well as I do, and they knew it, that if Travis was arrested, he would not be tried by a jury of his peers. That's another Anglo tradition. And he would not be tried by a jury of his peers down in say Anahuac or San Felipe or Nacogdoches or Mina which is today Bastrop he Travis would be tried by others down in Mexico City or Saltillo but folks friendly to Santana and it may not even be a jury would probably in fact would not be a jury the Texians may not have always agreed with what Travis had done but they were not going to give one of theirs up and just hand him over to frankly certain death in the Mexican legal system under now dictator Antonio Lopez de Santana and it sobered the Texians up and so before too long you're going to need a flashpoint I believe the Texas Revolution began at Anahuac but I also believe the flashpoint of the Texas Revolution the the real uh, thing that gets it going in 35 is at Gonzales and so you need the flashpoint and then that will happen I'm going to uh, stop the menu right, the video right now. I've got to go to class at 10 o'clock as I cut this video. So I'm going to finish my lectures on the Texas Revolution in a second video. So, anyways, I will uh, tell you this: uh, that if you uh, desire a little bump on your final exam grade, then you need to do this next thing for me. There will be on your final exam. Uh, I guarantee it to you. There are about about five dates on that final exam in a matching form. Those five dates are the Battle of the Alamo, what day did the Alamo fall? The Battle of San Jacinto, what day did the Battle of San Jacinto occur? The Massacre at Goliad, when did the Massacre at Goliad occur? What date did that happen on? What is Texas Independence Day? Which day is that? And last but not least, the Battle and, and Siege of Behar in 1835. When did that occur? If you want to bump on your final exam grade, in addition to what it, it, those questions will be on the final exam, amongst others, if you want to bump on your final exam grade, what you need to bring me on Thursday, 
when we have uh, when we have the optimal exam. You don't have to stay, but all you have to bring me are those dates, all five of those dates that I just said to you. Bring them to me on a piece of paper with your name on it, and I will be glad to uh, uh, put a little. Uh, I guess you're going to say seven and a half, ten points on ten points on a hundred and fifty point exam. So a little bump right there might be uh, all you need between an A and a B, a B and a C, and that sort of thing. So uh, you bring it to me on that day, you turn it in, and I'll just put it in my filing cabinet, and we'll be good to go. So uh, just FYI for you. If you got any questions, you may email me, but uh, look for uh, two links, and uh, you'll be able to watch the second one in due time. Thank you. We'll see you soon.